Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The War Report. Now, I just need to cover a couple things just before we get started, just to let you know a little bit about the format of this episode. So firstly, I am alone this episode. GSP and I had some schedule conflicts, and he wasn't able to make it. And it's probably going to be like this for this episode and the next episode. Uh, we should have things sorted out shortly. He just has some real-life matters to attend to that I, I, I won't get in for the sake of his privacy. But it's only going to be a brief absence on his end, so I will do the best I can for the Minutia Minute. Mine will not be nearly as detailed. I won't have the maps getting into nitty-gritty detail. Because that's really just a specialty. He has a knack for it. And something that I really just can't replicate. It, it It's a skill. It's a talent. So, once again, we're all very grateful that he does that. But, unfortunately, it's going to be a bit bare-bones compared to usual. I'm going to do the best I can. Try to provide the best analysis I can. But... The Minutia Minute is actually going to be only a minor part of the show because of the recent news out of Moscow, of course, which I will do the best I can to cover with the information we have right now because there's still a lot happening. But these events were too big to ignore and too big to put off. I'm recording this as of the 23rd of March, 2024. So by the time this actually goes live on... 24th of March 2024, some of this information may be out of date, if not at outright inaccurate, so I'm going to do the best I can. Apology in advance for anything that I may have gotten wrong or insufficiently covered. And we do have a few other news items, such as some items on the Middle East that I won't dwell on too much, because it's going to be mostly a program about Ukraine and Russia. I'm doing the best I can with the limited resources I have, and with us down to a solo show. So hopefully... My voice for however long I am able to, uh, however long it takes me to cover these, hopefully it doesn't get too monotonous with only one of us speaking, uh, more of a monologue rather than a dialogue. And don't worry, this is only temporary, of course, he will be back shortly, but like I said, there were, there were just too many things as of this week I just could not ignore. So let's get into it. I'm going to start just by going over the MOD reports from Ukrainian and Russian Ministry of Defenses. So, just on a general front, the Ukrainian MOD tells us there have been 64 combat engagements with Russian forces, and this is all across the front. And these are the Ukrainian translations, the names. I do know some of the Russian translations, which of course I prefer to use. I don't like using the Ukrainian translations, but please just bear with me if I mispronounce anything or use the wrong, let's just say, flavor of name. But I think we'll all get the point here. So, the Ukrainian MOD reports engagements along Bilohorivka in Luhansk, Terny, Yampolivka, Rodzovica, Velese, and Donbass, Kalichkivka, Bodanivka, Ivanovske in Donetsk, Berdichi, Toneke, Peromaiske in Donetsk once again, Krasnohorivka, Herohigivka, Noma Mihailovka, Konstantinivka, and on Robotine on Zaporozhia and Krinky in Kherson, and that is according to the general staff of the Ukrainian Armed Forces. Just a brief list of combat engagements on the ground for now. However, when it has come to shelling, when it has come to artillery clashes, it has been much more intense, and I'll get into some of the stories about the Russian airstrikes in just, just a moment here, but just to give you a brief overview of what we were looking at on the front right now. So, in the Kherson region, you had Russian shellings in Berhunka, Tianka, Kizomis, Stanislav, and Kherson City. There were also airstrikes on Tokarivka, and in the 
Orekhiv's direction, there were shellings at Polta Poltavka, Malinivka, Jarnive, Bihoraya, Nova Danilivka, Pietkani of Zaporozhia, and there were also airstrikes on Staromyskoy in Donbass, Malinivka, and Stepove in Zaporozhia. Moving on in further north of the front. In the Novopolivka direction, there were shellings at Krasnohorivka, Herokhinivka, Peraskovika in Donetsk, and also airstrikes at Ugladar, or Vugladar, as the Ukrainians would refer to it. There is, in the direction of Avdeyevka, uh, there were shellings at Novobotmukhivka, Berdichi, Semenivka, Pervomaiske, Nevelske, and airstrikes on Yumanske and Semenvika in Donbass. In the Bakhmut direction, there were shellings at Botanivka, Chasov Yar. Ch uh, there's been a lot of activity in Chasov Yar that I will get into in just a moment here. Um, Klitschivka, Andreevka on the Donbass, and then there were also Russian airstrikes in Chasov Yar, Donche, and Druzhba in Donbass. So moving once again further north in the direction of Liman, there were Russian shellings at Mekivka, Nevske, and Torske. Sebr, Bianca, all in the Donbass region. And in the Kupians direction, there were shellings in Holubka, uh, Russian shellings in Holubvika, Dvorchina, Tsinsikiva of the Kharkiv region, and there were also airstrikes on Kislivka in Kharkiv as well. To continue on, in the Siversh-China and Slobo-Zanchina regions, there were Russian shelling attacks in Huta, Studenska, Bleshnia, Korpovchini of Chernigov, uh, excuse me, Bilo, Pila, Kindrativa, Zapisila in Sumi, Kozasha Loban, Vovchans, Krasne, Neskune in the Kharkiv region, and then there were also Russian airstrikes on Serdina Buna and Vojobona in the Sumi region, Zemlantki, Portihovke, Bolohivka in Kharkiv, and then moving on to the Russian MOD reports. Once again, apologies if I, uh, for the mispronunciations there. In the south, according to Russian MOD sources. There were Ukrainian shellings in Kolyana Pristan, Alekshi, Kahovka, Nova Kahovka, Dnieper Priani, Kacheri Legeri, Podstepnoe, and Pecha Chanovka. And according to Russian sources from the quote unquote underground in Nikolaev, the Russian troops managed to hit an armor vehicle manufacturing plant in the city of Nikolaev, and there were advances near Ivanovka on the Russian front, and also there were advances and engagements along Stepovne and Robotino, Staromoyske, Pavlovka, Novomihailovka. Georgievka, Perovomyskoye, and Birdici in the direction of the in the Donbass region, excuse me. There were shellings in Donetsk once again, shelling of Gorlovka and Ozer Yanovka. And advances do continue once again along Chasovyar and that does seem to be the concentration of the Russian forces at this point, as well as activity in Kharkov. There has been an increase in airstrikes in Kharkov. So, uh, once again, forgive me if that is not as in-depth as what we usually have. 
I I'm just working with the information we have here. And what has also been happening in Ukraine beyond individual movement on the front, because aside from a few breakthroughs, which I do want to wait for GSP to return before we get too much in detail about this. I don't want to spoil it too much and have his voice be lost because I, I do really like hearing what he has to say, as I imagine all of us do. So I'm just trying to be as brief as possible with that. But there was an exchange of airstrikes and attacks by Russia and Ukraine where the Ukrainians were hitting oil fields and oil refineries in southern Russia. And as a response, you saw a barrage of Russian missiles and airstrikes in response to that, hitting in particular a lot of energy infrastructure across Ukraine. They hit the power plant in Dnipro region, which is at Dnipro Petrovsk, um, if, just to give you an idea of the area. Uh, they hit the power plant there, not a nuclear power plant, just a power plant. And they had been launching strikes across infrastructure all across the east. Now, some may wonder why this was not done before. And it took until October 2022, for those of you who recall, for the Russian, and actually after the first attack on the Kerch Bridge, for the Russians to start unleashing strikes on Ukrainian infrastructure and Ukrainian energy infrastructure in particular. And those were light strikes compared to what we have now. They've been hammering a lot more. And it was a calculated decision over the course of the war because the Russians went in at least desiring a much smaller operation, as we all know, with the number of troops, the resources that they sent. And some may say that was incompetent. Some may say there was a greater plan behind that. But point being is, the Russians were very conciliatory in many places in the East, with hopes of integrating them, with hopes of leaving goodwill after the war. As we all know, we can go back to the peace treaty that was scrapped in April of 2022, which was very generous to Ukraine in those terms. So they wanted to leave Ukraine as undamaged as possible, especially considering that many of these areas, after the peace treaty fell through, were liable to be absorbed into Russia. So... As a result of that, they just wanted to play it safe. They didn't want to have... They would want as little as reconstruction as possible, so a lot of the energy and civilian infrastructure was spared. It, although, according to quote-unquote international law, which doesn't mean much, these infrastructure, energy infrastructure, is considered technically a valid target, but, like I said, we all know how that is applied realistically, so we can just write that off. But... Then, there were more raids into Belograd. There were more shelling along the front in Kursk and Bryansk, in these border towns with Russia and Ukraine, or the Ukrainian-controlled territories. And those were up in intensity. It did seem that in the lead-up to the Russian election, which I will have a bit more to say when we get into just the news about Russia in general, that the Ukrainians were trying to employ, I guess what you could consider intimidation or terror tactics, but they look rather mild compared to what we had witnessed, and if you want to attribute the Moscow attacks to Ukraine, which I will make the case for, and also make the case against coming up in a little bit here, but with the elections coming up, they wanted to have the show of strength, push these raids in the border towns, and as the situation on the front line became more and more desperate, they wanted to resort to these type of attacks to perhaps shake the confidence of the Russian people in their own state apparatus. And perhaps that was the case there. But then, we, moving into that, all of that's been happening since at least last fall. But it has picked up intensity over the past few months. We move on to the major story, which, like I said, I, I will try to keep all of this brief because I don't want to talk about too much of this without GSP. I just feel the need to get you guys a brief rundown of everything that's happened in the past week just because a lot has come up. And that is the attacks in Moscow. So these happened around 
let's see, that would be, I believe about 10 o'clock p.m. Moscow time. It was at a concert in Krosh City Hall. Now, perhaps I've, I've mispronounced that. Once again, apologies, but uh, just working with what we have here, which is a, a concert venue, rather major one, in Russia. Initial reports had five gunmen storming into the concert hall and opening fire, and other reports had four plus associates and collaborators. At some point, the building was lit on fire because it did eventually collapse in. And after the night's events, which were terrible to say the least, I I don't recommend watching the footage to anyone who isn't prepared to see uh, what you would expect there. It's not for the faint of heart. It's not something that you exactly want to dive into. A lot of the footage I saw was not on purpose, and I, I could have gone without seeing it. And the casualty count, it, it has been fluctuating, of course, as new information comes in. But at this point, as of recording, is over 120. In, uh, with 40 of those being deaths. And 120 in, in total just casualties, injuries, everything else with 40 actually confirmed dead as this, unfortunately, of all ages, because that is what happened. And you had the suspects fleeing, and there were actually even more casualties in the uh, fleeing. They did strike somebody with an automobile uh, on, their, on their escape route. And... One, at least one of the men was apprehended in Bryansk, heading towards the Ukrainian border. Officially, thus far, ISIS has claimed responsibility for the attack, and ISIS has been more or less radio silent ever since they suffered major blows on the battlefield in Syria and Iraq in 2017 through 2018. I'm sure you remember those uh, first few years. Uh, when Trump was in office, there was a bit of a lightening up on American policy in Syria, not entirely, which gave way to ISIS collapsing more as there was more support for shifted towards Kurdish forces. There was an easing, somewhat of an easing of tensions between the U.S. and Russia, which allowed for greater cooperation on the issue of ISIS. And... Some were trying to say it's ISIS-K, which is the Afghan branch of ISIS. Uh, they've denied it, but ISIS overall has claimed it. it, it once again, it, it's getting murky. And then you also have to consider that ISIS, even back at its height, was something people would commit these acts and then pledge allegiance to as a result. That It wasn't necessarily coordinated beyond insurgency operations in places like Iraq, Syria, and the wider Middle East. Virtually anyone could pledge allegiance to them and commit attacks in their name. And they're infamous for claiming responsibility for many of the things that they have nothing to do with. So far, the official state narratives of Russia, of the U.S., of Ukraine, of the West in general, have been just a, an agreement that it was ISIS. Now, there was speculation early on, even Medvedev came out, uh, Dmitry Medvedev came out and said... If these attacks are linked to the Ukrainian state, then we have no business negotiating with them. They've turned to terrorism, and we must, and I quote, return death for death. And those speculations have certainly not gone away, despite the fact that they have declared it as an ISIS attack. And perhaps it will be revisited, and just because it is does not necessarily mean that they didn't have foreign sponsors. One of the videos that came out of one of the captured alleged terrorists was very vague. He was very dodgy around the questions. He was a Tajik national, of course, and he refused to answer the question, refused to mention who paid him, talk about a telegram channel and how he was radicalized on there, didn't say by who, didn't say who provided the weapons, any of this. Now, 
you can attribute a lot of that, of course. He's not going to just cough up information. He's not just going to divulge his sources. But I I don't think anyone will be surprised by this. I am almost entirely certain that I will leave a little bit of room. Perhaps I could be wrong. I'm not saying I'm 100% certain on this. But if you forced me to pick what I believe happened... This was an SBU operation with the backing of the usual suspects. We all know how integrated the SBU is with the CIA, so one of the same SBU is just a cadet branch of the CIA at this point. And I fully believe that it was them. And the case I'll make for it is that you had this tit-for-tat escalation on the front, especially with Bologograd, especially with how hard... Bill Gorod has been getting hit in the past few months. The Kremlin making statements hinting that it wants to escalate to all-out war and change the legal designation of the military conflict in Ukraine to be a war uh, as far as the Russian Federation is concerned. Now, I've seen reports that they have done that already. However, I haven't been able to confirm anything. So perhaps by the time this comes out, there will be more information on that. But... That's something in speculation, if not has already happened already, which would loosen up the some of the restrictions, the self-imposed restrictions the Russian military has had operating in Ukraine. And it also would bear some consequences in terms of international law. However, at this point, Russia has already borne those consequences, so they have nothing left to lose by escalating the legal status of this conflict. And we'll see if that actually pans out. I don't want to delve too far into it because I haven't found anything that at least I have seen to be a reliable source, of course. It's just the rumor mill. But once again, this is even in discussion before these attacks happened, actually the morning of these attacks. Because just to return to those, when I first saw that, I assumed it was some... Russian Freedom Legion, or some Muslim foreign national, or Ukrainian infiltrator with a rifle and let off a few shots and took a few casualties. That's, when I first saw the headlines, that's what I was expecting it to be. But then it just got worse, and it got worse, and it got worse. And I do fear that this is the beginning of a, of, of a major escalation. Now, there are some trying to claim, not unreasonably in a vacuum, but given the context, I do think it's pretty unreasonable, that this was an FSB op, this was an inside job, that Putin and the Russian state want to have something shocking happen in order to rally the public further behind the war effort, which I'm not putting past the Russian state. I don't think they're morally incapable of it. But practically... That being said, I don't think really any state is more than capable of pulling a false flag on its people, but practically speaking, we're two years into a war where the people have certainly a majority support for it, if not an overwhelming support for it. Putin just secured re-election, even if you want to believe the numbers are pumped up. He still holds a very high approval rating in the nation. Most people are at least content with his policies. In fact, those who aren't as has been said many times, as I repeat, think that he actually doesn't go far enough. There, There is a liberal contingent in Russia, of course, but in terms of power and influence, it, they're, they're mostly negligible. They're enough to be a thorn in the side of the Russian state. However, they're not enough to stage a full-blown color revolution. Also, it would have happened already. I mean, look at Navalny. He died in exile in a prison camp. That's, that's the fate of the Russian liberal movement right there. Uh, the so-called liberal candidate in Russia received something along the line of 4% of the vote with the the communist and I believe he was neck and neck with the LDPR candidate. But point being, it was Putin with an overwhelming majority at officially 88%. Then Harutonov with the Communist Party coming in second with his 4% uh, percent and some decimal points, and then it was 
neck and neck for third place with Don, uh, Donikov, who was the quote-unquote liberal candidate, who actually was not all that liberal. He was just pro-negotiation on quote-unquote Russia's terms. And Slutsky, who was the LDPR candidate, who of course was saying, well, the Ukraine, it warned Ukraine needs to be bigger and better and we need to... Uh, launch a major offensive and take Kiev, and it, it's it's going to be great. So, you have all all these attacks coming right off the Russian election, and some had said, "Oh, it's a quote unquote election gift to Putin," uh, and of course by that they mean you rig the election, so therefore innocent people have to suffer the consequences. And the the same repugnant bile you get from these people every time something happens to somebody they don't like. And a, a lot of these are, are the liberal types. A lot of these are the types who celebrated, for example, when Ashley Babbitt, uh, during the Capitol riots, was shot. And uh, they celebrate whenever anything bad happens to anyone slightly to the right of them. What We all know the, the kind of people we're talking about, the, the real rabid liberal core of American politics. Now, of course... The politicians, they have optics to consider. You had all the official condemnations, but they were certain to say, well, yeah, we condemn what happens, uh, very sad, but we're for certain it was not Ukraine, that Ukraine had nothing to do with it. And then Zelensky puts out his bloviating statement saying that uh, Putin is an awful man and he's he's trying to pin his false flag on us, which, I mean, the two states are at war. It's pretty clear that this war is not going to end with those two meeting, in order for any negotiations to proceed, one of them would have to fall out of power, and Zelensky is far more likely in that case, so him making these inflammatory statements is nothing new. Now, Kubela made a statement of more moderate, It was although it was in the wake of the attack, saying, well, it, terrorism against innocent civilians is wrong, but uh, we had absolutely nothing to do with this, we condemned this, and, and yeah, it's, it's nothing that we have to do with it, and don't point any fingers at us and look into the issue no further. And I would I would be sympathetic to the case that this was not a Ukrainian operation or an operation that Ukraine carried out at the behest of one of the larger Western intelligence agencies. And of course, just because ICE is involved, we all know the history of ISIS and their cooperation with intelligence agencies, so so that would be nothing new. By, by, by no means are they mutually exclusive. But given the previously mentioned attacks into Belgorod, which happened once again, there were attacks actually just a few minutes before I started recording this as well, and with the men fleeing towards Bryansk, I am very hard-pressed to believe that these weren't some foreign nationals who were in Russia because of, let's just be honest, the failure in their immigration policy. I mean, I say that with no ill will or malintent towards the Russians, but, and many of them have, have brought this issue, uh, to my attention in particular, that their immigration system from Central Asia is far too lax. And I do think that, in many cases, such as what we see in Western countries, that a lot of bad actors do slip through the cracks. And there is migrant violence in Russia, as there is everywhere else. Now, one thing I will say in Russia's favor is that you actually do have a grassroots movement of people who do stand up and fight back. Look, I don't fault anyone for not putting their lives and freedom on the line for doing that. I, But I do commend those who absolutely do stand up for what's right in those situations. But I, I will say, just on personal observation, I could be wrong, I see a lot more of a grassroots opposition by the people of Russia, particularly the Russian men, against this than, than I do in the West. But when, that's that's side the point. I'm, I'm just getting to the point that, yes, Russia did have a gaping security flaw in its migration system. And hopefully this will be something that wakes them up to that, and this will be something that allows them to reform that system and, and shut down a lot of the loose migration from these parts of the world. And I don't want to 
could talk about too much political capitalization in light of the tragedy, but I do think, frankly, the best thing they could do is they could use this to push for anti-immigration. I know that there have been those remarks coming out of Russian political talk for the past few months now, and perhaps that was just pre-election rhetoric. I generally don't know, but point being is I, I hope like all nations, that they do get that resolved. And I do think, to repeat that, yes, it did create a security flaw, but you have these guys who otherwise would sit around in their apartments in wherever they're at, and this is the same case as what happened in Paris and what happened with the rash of terrorist attacks across Europe in 2015, 2016, 2017. These guys who otherwise were just bloviating and talking about how they want to be great martyrs or, or whatever. They get approached and they by people who say, we have the means that make that happen. Usually some imam some running out of some madrasa or uh, mosque that has radical connections that were through Saudi Arabia now, insofar as Saudi Arabia's sponsorship of those. I know that Mohammed bin Salman, I'm not saying he's a great guy or anything, but has changed the direction of the Saudi state and has really tried to scrub a lot of those elements to his credit. Now, I'm not saying it was entirely successful. There still are other elements in Saudi Arabia that he does not have control over. A lot of people with money, a lot of people from the Gulf states, a lot of rich Muslims in the world who finance these places uh, across the Muslim world. Perhaps it was Muslim Brotherhood. I doubt that. But once again, we're speculating too much, at least on that point. And you have these, these men who are radicalized by some means or another, uh, power players, whether that be intelligence agencies, other state apparatuses, approach these people and say, well, you can do this, this, and this, and we'll have your back, and use them as as pawns. I've heard people compare them to uh, the modern equivalent of privateers. These people are just guns for hire, and they'll do virtually anything you want. They will commit these down-and-dirty actions on behalf of a foreign state, in a deniable sense. Now, of course, when they did apprehend the one suspect, he did say, oh, I did it for money, uh, 500,000 rubles, which, when it comes to the currency exchange rate, is really not that much. Even if he was desperately poor, it's still, it doesn't add up, and especially considering that he, what he had to do to get it, and the fact that it was almost certainly going to end either in his death or his apprehension um, by Russian state authorities, once again, there, there's so much, so many details we don't know, but there's enough to know that this is not sitting right, that four guys and their collaborators could not have just sat around and planned this out, uh, especially with the, the equipment they had. There, it's alleged that they had an AK-12, which is a new rifle in the Russian military. The only way they could have gotten that is either they had there was somebody in the Russian military who sold it to the black market and it landed in their hands. The Ukrainians might have had a captured stockpile of them. Or, like I said, just other arms smuggling means. Uh, but uh, Or perhaps there were subversive elements within the Russian military that makes it happen. They're not immune to that. No state's immune to that. And you could argue with some of the strikes that have been in Russia, there have been some subversive elements, especially early on in the war with the action in Crimea. I, I do think there is something of a case to be made there. I, I won't go too, into too much detail about that for now. But... Getting back to the point, but getting back to the point, there, there's a number of ways to, to convince these people to entice them to do these things. And like I said, just because some radical does something or some Muslim is radicalized by some means, there's usually somebody they're taking marching orders from either directly or indirectly. So... Well, yes, you can just write this off as an ice attack. ISIS has resurged all of a sudden, despite the fact that the only thing you've heard of ISIS in the past four years is the assassination of Syrian intelligence officers in eastern Syria, and potentially that one terrorist attack in Iran a few months ago. But other than that, that's, that's what they've been reduced to. Them being able to pull off the major attacks that they did ten years ago, it's, it's unrealistic, to say the least, especially... 
if you think that they did this alone, they went at this alone without some sort of state sponsor, which logically points to the Ukrainians first and foremost, if not their Western backers in, in another way. I mean, we saw this with Nord Stream. The Russians blew it up themselves. It later comes out that while they'll never admit it, it was an American intelligence op, either directly or indirectly. And there's just been a number of instances like this over the years. They tried to claim that in, in 99, when there was the rash of Chechen terrorism, that Putin false flag one of those in order to escalate the war there, which I I would also need to see more evidence for. It. I, I'm not, once again, I'm not saying any of this because I think that he is morally above false flag attacks. He, he is a politician. He is a former intelligence man himself. Not, I'm, I'm not saying that's he's irredeemably evil because of that, or he's necessarily a bad leader. I certainly have very nuanced thoughts on Putin, but it just doesn't make sense given the scenario on the ground, given what we're working with. And if any of you have more information or a more compelling case as to why it might be, I would, I would like to look into that because I do think that as it stands now, this is an intelligence failure for Russia that it does somewhat shake the confidence of Putin, but at this point, we all know who's responsible, and I'm sure you can close the gaps. You, they need to close the gaps when it comes to intelligence and security failures. But if you know the responsible party, I would say that eliminating them is of, of equal importance. And, I mean, you could say I'm a hypocrite because of that, because my position on 9-11 is that major intelligence failures, heads needed to figuratively roll, so to speak. But, assuming that Bin Laden and all these other people were actually involved, it, it would have been more than justified to go after them. Assuming we were told some something resembling the truth in Afghanistan, our overthrow of the Taliban government in 2001 and hunt for Osama Bin Laden was completely justified. Now, it turns out those waters were a lot muddier than they first appeared, so it, it does lend itself to more internal criticisms of the intelligence agency of the U.S. government at that point. But what we're looking at right here, it's, it's not a direct comparison, where I do think that, yes, while the Russian state may bear some responsibility for its failures here, Primarily, this is coming out of Ukraine, and this is coming out of Ukraine for very obvious reasons, and it shows that what looked like a war that was on the brink of ending because of a lack of U.S. support, that's that's going completely out the window. And don't worry, in a couple minutes here, I'll move on to some of the bloviating comments out of Macron and just the Europeans in general, and the speculated NATO interventions in this war. And... I I had to be honest, uh, this is one of the worst things I've, I've seen in quite some time. This was, uh, because like, I, I think what happened was, at least speaking with me person, uh, speaking from a personal perspective, that yes, I, I expected this to be some one-off thing with the, with a few casualties, maybe a few injuries, even, a, maybe even a couple deaths. But then I, I saw the scale of this. I mean, the building was burned and it completely the ceiling collapsed on the building. That, that, that was the level of damage. And like I said, we're looking at over 120 casualties at, at this point. And I I really don't know what to say just from beyond just the analysis and everything. I mean, it, it was terrible. It's one of the worst terror attacks across the world that we've seen in quite some time in the past few years. And... I'm afraid that this is only the beginning, especially with how the Ukrainians are going to turn in the direction of this war. Even assuming this war comes to some sort of conclusion favorable to the Russians, you get the annexation of territory, even maybe even a little more than what they have now. You get the Kiev regime either to capitulate to neutrality demands or their complete implosion, and the constitution of a new regime in Kiev, you're still going to have a number of spurned Ukrainians, spurned skilled Ukrainians, who are going to conduct these operations inside of Russia and towards Russian assets across the world. Because when the Ukraine, if the Ukrainian state collapsed under those circumstances, or it even remains intact, you're going to have these SPU guys who are bitter 
that their country lost this war and had ceded this territory, feel betrayed by the West, how they might even turn their guns to the West at that point, and they'll conduct these attacks. And it does create a major security challenge for Russia in the in the coming years, coming decades. And then, to, I mean, to top all of this off, we had the U.S. Embassy putting out warnings telling American nationals to avoid public gatherings for the next couple of weeks on March 7th. And then, of course, this happened. So that only uh, raises more suspicion. Perhaps this was some sort of... Perhaps the Russians interpreted this as some sort of mind game. Because when two nations are at least on decent terms and you get a intelligence warning, you would think, oh, okay, um, that they're looking out for us just for the sake of uh, common decency and goodwill between states, which does happen. Uh, and you could even return to the October 7th attacks in Israel and look at Egypt. When a state that you are in hostile terms with, not necessarily at war, but a state that you are in hostile terms with, and I would argue that even before all, all of this, Egypt and Israel were on hostile terms just because of the nature of the situation. If that nation gives you a heads up, gives you an intelligence tip, for all you know, that is to mislead you. That is to get you to divert resources. That is to get you to do something stupid and make a mistake. Perhaps what the Russians interpret this as, which I don't think is an unfair interpretation, at least at the time, is, well, they're just trying to fear monger. They're trying to make us paranoid in on our own streets, so this could be dismissed. But, I mean, the more sinister view is that they were warning their own people that, hey, we have a heads up on this operation, so you need to stay away. We don't want any of you involved in, in this sort of operation, so stand down. And, I mean, I think people are putting more emphasis on the embassy thing than what needs to. So I think there's greater piece of evidence just speaking from the circumstances that have happened in Ukraine, especially in the, in the immediate lead-up to this, the same day as this, that there's far better evidence to make a case for Ukrainian and, and Western involvement in all of this. But those are just my brief thoughts. I, I'm sure we will return to the subject. And I especially want to get GSP's thoughts when he is available on this, uh, because this is a story that's not going to go away. Unfortunately, I do think that more of these incidents will at least be attempted. But with that being said, I'm going to move back to Ukraine to discuss the question of NATO involvement. So for the past couple weeks, Macron has been making very aggressive statements talking about the potential of a NATO force getting involved in this war. And now he's saying that, yes, he's preparing French troops, and it's speculated that they're going to be stationed around Odessa and Kiev in order to deter any further Russian advancements. They said that if Russia advances towards Odessa, we will deploy troops in the city in order to prevent, in order to more or less create a tripwire that if you go any further, you're going to attack these forces. We're going to construe that as Article 5, even though it does not even meet the definition of Article 5 as enumerated by Article 6 of the NATO Treaty. And yeah, we're going to drag all of NATO into this war. So, the question is, do we actually believe that would happen? And I would say, assuming we even get the French deployments, assuming this isn't all just belligerence and saber-rattling for the sake of creating an image of strength, both domestically and internationally, and I mean, one can consider the EU Parliament elections coming up and that Macron wants to win over the hawkish base for his party and his coalition, but I... I understand that, but I find it a less a less in-depth answer. I think there's, there's, once again, better answers out there. And given how much the West is staked in this war, they need to take that next level of escalation. They do need to do something to bail the Ukrainians out. They need to do something in order to save credibility, because they have staked so much into this war in Ukraine. And if they're not willing to draw those red lines, if they're not willing to enforce those red lines, they're going to look further and further like a joke. This war has been an embarrassment for NATO. Although Ukraine is not a NATO country, it, it was in cooperation with them for eight years. Their military was, quote-unquote, modernized by them from 2014 
in anticipation of the outbreak of this very war. And while the Ukrainians have had their successes in some areas, it has been a general momentum against them. And looking at that, assuming there was to be escalation, if we are to believe all the fear-mongering about Russia, if Poland and the Baltic states are next, do Poland and the Baltic states feel secure, given what happened to Ukraine, a country that they more or less made these security guarantees to and failed to live up to? I know if I were a Polar Balt, which fortunately I'm not, but I would not feel secure in, in those guarantees. I would feel that NATO had dropped the ball and that they are a less competent organization because of the outcome in Ukraine, especially if they forced peace. Now, I'm not saying that from my personal view. I'm saying that from the view of these, uh, what some might call paranoid minds in Poland and the Baltic states and in other parts of Europe, that NATO has put its entire reputation on the line in order to secure a favorable outcome in Ukraine. In Ukraine, And this seems to be the result. So the idea of the French and, among other Europeans, going in to at least serve as a deterrence for a tripwire for the Russians going any further, particularly towards Odessa, it, it, does, it does logically make sense. Although I have heard a much more plausible theory that could be a workaround for all of this. Some have speculated that a multinational coalition of NATO states are going to secure the Ukrainian-Belarusian border. Because although Ukraine and Belarus are not at war, it is speculated that at some point Russia will use that to open another front. Now, I have yet to see that happening. I think the Russian station tr- stationing troops in Belarus is more of a hedge against any potential NATO involvement rather than... In a, it's more of a defensive move than an offensive move. That they were anticipating action out of Poland, they were anticipating action out of the Baltic states, or a potential severance to the access route to Kaliningrad, which is an exclave that Russia has no no land connection to otherwise, and that they would need that garrison there as a jumping-off point to liberate any sort of corridor to Kaliningrad or to stave off any sort of Polish involvement. But it is speculated by some and many in the West that uh, either Belarus will get involved in this war, or Russia, through Belarus, will try to open another front. So... One of the speculated plans is that the NATO coalition will build the defenses along the Belarusian border, that French and assorted other troops will take care of those duties, so the Ukrainian units on those patrols can be re-diverted to the front and put more into the meat grinder. Because that does seem to be what they want to do. Of course, the conscription crisis continues in Ukraine, the manpower crisis continues in Ukraine. That would alleviate a significant number of men from those trained soldiers who are along those border guards. Now, I don't know how much combat experience they had. I don't know what the rotations are for those. So, but it, it's certainly better than what they're working with right now. And I, I'll be honest, I have to take the French at their word here. And I, I have to take them at face value here. Their bluster only goes so far. Saber rattling only goes so far. You want an example of saber rattling in the Ukraine war? That was the U.S. deployment of airborne forces in Romania back during the first Russian push towards Nikolaev, which deterred them from doing that. That was just a show of force, having U.S. troops there, having NATO show off, show its teeth, and the Russians back down because they didn't want to risk it. Well, at this point, virtually everything but them shooting at each other, and when you consider that there's already thousands of NATO troops unofficially in Ukraine at this point, serving as volunteers or advisors or whatever. We all know that they're fighting on the front lines. We have more than enough evidence to know that. And especially after the strikes towards the hotel that was hosting French mercenaries in Kharkov, the gloves were off at that point. The French, they were exposed for getting involved in this war. Now, to what degree they're involved in terms of at least boots on the ground, that is questionable. But this is also the same country that has sent several aid packages in terms of arms and armament to the Ukrainians. So they're clearly more than involved in this. And and some question, do they have the industrial capacity to continue this war? Do they have the industrial capacity to match Russia? I mean, you look at the production numbers, they don't, quite simply. And that French industry, because of severance from Russian energy and resources, is floundering. So them trying to revamp a war industry is also a bit of a stretch. 
the logistical network trying to establish all the way from France to Ukraine. I know that they would have other NATO states and that they're on friendly terms with the other NATO states, of course. But that's also convincing at least Germany and Poland to get involved in this. And any larger NATO effort is going to require the cooperation of the United States in terms of transports, in terms of logistics, in terms of resources, especially resources. If you want to revamp French industry, you're going to need the United States, whether the United States is investing in it, providing energy, or if not outright taking over production of ammunition, arms, and other equipment required to wage the kind of war, or wage at least the kind of military operation the French are planning to take part of. I don't expect some sort of uh, direct confrontation between France and Russia. I expect them to send, I guess what we call an expeditionary force to close the gap in some of these areas. Like, as we all know that we've had thousands of NATO mercenaries on the ground here, uh, from the highest to the lowest ranks, from private all the way to general. So this is nothing new. This would just be the next logical step in what's happening officiating their presence there, which would also give them more room to maneuver, both figuratively and literally, on the battlefield when it comes to the actions they could perform in Ukraine. But it's a tenuous situation, and I do believe, at this point, Macron is so desperate for his political legitimacy, both at home and especially abroad, that he's willing to shoulder this effort, that he's willing to show, quote-unquote, European leadership, because, to quote his statements, if Ukraine falls, then France will be next. That is the line that he's pulling, and that's the line he's trying to sell to the rest of the Europeans. And I believe that in terms of political legitimacy, and let's be honest, just given the man we're talking about, legacy, he wants that name in the history books. Imagine being the man who went in and stopped Russia, according to his greatest fantasies, the man who uh, got involved in some cataclysmic historical event. Even if it didn't turn out, I do think that, just personally speaking, Macron does have the ego to want something like that. I... I don't want to make the Napoleon comparison because it is overblown, it's overplayed, and it's frankly not that accurate. But he wants that his name in the history books in that regard. And I think he's willing to take extremely escatorial measures in order to accomplish that. And I do think we're seeing that play out right now. And the reason I think it hasn't happened yet, and that we're still seeing the can kicked down the road, is that it's simply a matter of lack of resources rather than lack of will, combined with a potential backlash from the French and European public. Because if they get too involved in this war, if it becomes too demanding on their lives, they're going to oppose this. While you can rile a lot of people up into the anti-Russia sentiments in Europe, beyond a handful of nationalists in Eastern European countries... Poland, Romania, the Baltic states, etc. Actually convincing these people to fight is going to be a much harder sell. It'd be a much easier sell to Poland that you're next after Ukraine and, and uh, you better be afraid and if you don't get involved, you are gonna have, you can either fight them in Ukraine or fight them in Poland. I mean, that would be a, a better narrative, but Poland is in such a disarray politically. I don't think it's happening. And that's also on top of the grain disputes and the refugees. And although... The Poles are by no means sympathetic to the Russians in this war. A lot of the goodwill between them and the Ukrainians has been expended, to say the least. And that's the same with a lot of other Eastern European countries, where their governments might be on board with the NATO agenda. A lot of their nationalists, for example, you have the Romanians participate in one of those border raids in Belgorod, and actually even the Germans, too. While you have, may have elements like that, after a certain point... They're only willing to give so much to this. When the Russians are not on their doorstep, when they're not on their border, when the entirety of Ukraine is between them and Russia, they lose sympathy because these people have no more real love for the Ukrainians as a nation than they do the Russians. And it, you can you can see this t time again that it, it, it clearly is an enemy of my enemy situation where they're willing to throw their weight behind Ukraine for that reason. But ultimately, it's not out of some great love for Ukraine. I doubt that, say, Poland or Romania or any of these other countries want a strong Ukrainian victory That it, because it eclipses them. Even if it's not an outright threat, it eclipses them in terms of NATO relevance. It becomes the new 
attack dog of American Europe, having that strong armed Ukraine heading towards Russia, pointed in the direction of Russia. You eliminate the irrelevance of Poland at that point. At that point, they can do whatever they want in Poland. They don't have to placate their right wing anymore. And you even saw that starting to slip away. They don't have to placate that right wing anymore, or these uh, nationalist movements, and they get liquidated. They get sent to the dustbin of history. And that is simply because they valued saber-rattling and showing their teeth over their own actual national interest. That isn't saying that they had to become vassal states of the, of the Russians. But I do think that all the countries in Europe, especially in Eastern Europe, could have learned a lesson from Hungary in terms of pragmatism and foreign policy. And you could say, yeah, there's flaws in the Hungarian foreign policy, as there is everywhere. But it does show a level of pragmatism that has been uh, not heard of in Europe for a number of decades at this point. And I do think that with the succession of events over the past, say, week and a half, especially in Ukraine, with French rhetoric and the attacks and the further incursions into Russian border territory, that NATO is dedicated by whatever means they can spare to keep this war going and to escalate this war because negotiations are off the table. We've seen the Russian elections. Even if we're going to assume that they've been pumped up, which, if we're being honest, yes, there probably was some dishonest means when it came to collecting the ballots. But we can assume just from external observation and polls conducted by firms that have no interest in making Putin seem more popular than it is, that he does have the mandate of the Russian people, and that there isn't a distant element they can play on. There isn't an element that they can use to infiltrate Russia by political means or by social means. So they have to dedicate themselves to weakening Russia however they can. Now, I'm sure that balkanization is the dream of many. It's a pipe dream, but it is the dream of many. But they're going to do whatever they can to keep Russia hemmed in, to keep it weak, to, to keep it on its toes. They want to spark political crisis. They want to spark fear and paranoia in the Russian public. And I think a lot of the attacks, especially if we're going to go back to the idea that this was a Western-backed operation or Ukrainian-backed operation, they want to recreate that fear the Russians felt in the late 90s and the 2000s when Chechen separatism was at its height, when you had the 2002 theater hostage crisis in Moscow, when you had the Beslan school crisis in 2006, they want to create that atmosphere of fear and paranoia that Putin, through a number of political maneuvers that some may find objectionable uh, when it comes to his placation of certain uh, ethnic groups in Russia, did manage to navigate them out of that crisis and create uh, what has been more or less a lasting peace since the mid-2000s. And like I said, you could say he's too soft on some of these groups. You could say he's too lenient. Uh, maybe he lets the Chechens get away with too much. But at a certain point, it was that, or it was committing to more violence, more internal strife, more terrorist and insurgent actions. So while, like I said, the situation is not ideal, and hopefully it can be changed more in the favor of Russia in this favor as compared to some of these smaller constituent republics, it was it was the deal that had to be made to prevent further violence and bloodshed. Now, what I think we're seeing right now is they're trying to reignite that. And Russia has, and Russia and the Islamic world, especially ever since the defeat of ISIS, have been on, I won't say necessarily good terms, but they've had a mutual understanding, especially as the Americans begin to flounder. Russia has been on a just diplomatic journey through the Arab world, through the Muslim world, and has been currying favor with these people, and has been winning them over, especially in the Gulf states, which were once viewed as strongholds of U.S. influence in the region, and some of the uh, most vital U.S. partners. Uh, even Russia is making headway into there in places like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, etc. And what I do think is, is trying to happen, while, yes, these attackers may have been Muslim, while they may have been motivated by Islam, and there's a lot we could say about Islam as 
in ideology and religion, uh, if if you want to go down that road. At the at the end of the day, I do think that they that there are forces trying to exacerbate the enmity that exists between Russia and Islam, and trying to reignite the latent conflicts that had otherwise reached a satisfactory inclusion for a uh, conclusion for both parties while it may not be the best while some on both sides may be very dissatisfied with it and like I said I can I can sympathize with that it was an it was a common understanding it was the peaceful option it stopped the bloodshed it stopped the unnecessary death and I do think that while people do have their principles and while they should hold to it a lot of people will want to stop the violence at most, if not all costs. I do think that it is one of those cases. And not to dwell too much, once again, on these attacks in Russia, it... I, I really can't see it in any other way that is they're trying to reignite those tensions and trying to at least reignite that atmosphere, that uh, that fear and paranoia that the Russian people felt in the early 2000s. And we'll see if it'll work. It does seem like the Chechen leadership has been strong in condemning this, so they have been... The Chechens have been kept under well control, given that, say what you will about uh, Kadyrov and whatever opinions might have with him, with him. He is a good vassal to, the, to Moscow, and while some may be dissatisfied with... Um, the lenient treatment Chechnya gets, uh, it, it's really the best of a bad situation. And I I don't want to be too defensive of the Russian state and their actions. I don't want to paint them in too good light. Not that I'm far from anti-Russia, but not that I want to pretend like Russia can do no wrong here. It, 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 there's a number of political considerations, and I, I do think we are we are looking at those. But returning to, to the issue of NATO and Ukraine, it, it does come down to they've painted themselves into a corner. What else is NATO supposed to do in order to maintain its legitimacy? They had an off-ramp. They had a way out. They could have taken a minor L in all of this, seen the Donbass and Crimea ceded to Russia, and at that point they, they could have militarized Ukraine, they could have kicked this can down the road for five to ten more years, Minsk Three Agreement, all of that. But they decided to risk everything and come to a conclusion in this conflict. And, like I said, I hate to say it, but I don't see an off-ramp in this. Either one side or the other has to experience some sort of just irreparable political crisis that diminishes their influence in terms of this in order for the two ever to come to a common understanding that there has to be complete regime overhaul on one side or the other. And... While I, know, while I was laying out some of the problems with the Russian state earlier, I do think that is just as likely, if not more likely, in the West, especially considering the political tension in America, the controversies surrounding the elections, and just the state of the West in general. Uh, frankly, I think the Russians have the upper hand here when it comes to the waiting game. Not that the situation is perfect or ideal there, but I do think that they do have a number of key advantages over the West in that regard. And with all that being said, having gotten my thoughts out of everything related to Ukraine out of the way, I will just touch briefly on some Middle Eastern news to round out the show. Once again, I apologize if you are disappointed that this is a little bit of a shorter program, but as a one-man operation, there's only so much I can say to myself without the back and forth. Uh, so, I, I hope you guys have enjoyed it so far, just me rambling on unimpeded. So, we see further calls for Netanyahu to step down, to be removed, and we also see that there is no intention for the Israelis to cease their operations in Gaza, and that they do continue to push forward to Rafa and to continue this conflict regardless of what the U.S. says. Israel, once again, has has put itself in a situation where this has been going on since at least 1947, 1948. And I think that 
whatever you have to say about Israel or Netanyahu or Likud, which I have very negative things to say about all three of those, they're ready for an end to this. They're ready to stamp this problem out and create a permanent solution. There's been more pressure on Egypt to open up the border crossings. And because of that, because of all of this, you have Chuck Schumer, who was very much a steadfast ally of Israel. Let's make no mistake there. It was actually even on good terms with Netanyahu at some point. Has said that he's morally obligated to step down. That Israel needs to hold new elections. That they need to have a ceasefire. And that there needs to be some sort of political solution to this crisis. Because this crisis is such a black mark on the Democrats. Because when it comes to the Republicans... Beyond a few very hardline right-wingers and uh, stringent non-interventionists, most of them are going to at least be able to turn a blind eye to more of the brutal actions that Israel commits. They're, they're going to be able to overlook those, uh, if not outright support those. So that's that's no problem. They're, they're all right behind that. Trump is a big supporter of Israel, of course. We all know that story there. We saw that in his first term. But... The Democrats dealing with already a weak incumbent have to navigate the situation carefully where the quote-unquote left-wing president, the quote-unquote liberal, is overseeing Israel commit these actions with no real attempt to stop them, no threatening to cut off arm shipments, no threatening to stop this, just chiding and moral condemnation, wagging their finger and saying, no, it's uh, not okay, you can't attack Ra- Rafa. There, there's nothing we're going to do to stop you, but you simply can't do it, uh, because uh, that would be bad. And it just, uh, it's just an issue of moralizing and condemnations and trying to call out and call for... A, it, in some instances, it's not even a ceasefire, but call for vague notions of peace. And it doesn't seem like Biden's budging on that, but... It does seem like Schumer and a number of key Democrats are starting to sour on that prospect. And I don't think they're doing that out of some sort of moral or humanitarian concern. And number one, it alienates them from voters insofar as elections still matter. It does alienate them from voters. And that even though these people aren't going to quote-unquote flip to Trump, they might be motivated to stay home because at this point both candidates are in support of Israel, something I am deeply against, and I would rather sit on my own principles than uh, choose one or the other, because uh, both of them have let me down on a key issue, and that I'm not going to stand by this, I'm not going to have any part in this. And that's the attitude of a lot of people. So, you could see this, and I, I've made the point before, that somewhere with a large Muslim population, such as Dearborn in Michigan, uh, so Michigan the state, or even Minnesota, which has an ever-increasing Somali population, you might get these voters, these people who, the the ones who are able to vote, and you, know, you can ask the question about uh, uh, the the voter, how secure the elections are, which of course they're the utmost secure because of that, but you do have to wonder that if low turnout from them could potentially see those states go red. And I don't want to speculate too much on anything that early, but it, these are things that are, are worth taking into consideration. So, Netanyahu needs to go. And frankly, the U.S. simply cannot continue on the path that's going. I, I've made this point a million times before, especially if there is a conflict that sparks in East Asia. They simply cannot tolerate that because they're stretched thin as it is. They've had to divert arm shipments. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I saw some of the calls that... No, they've been saying this for a few months, but I've seen some of the calls renewed. Uh, the the real appeal to uh, to these people that halt all arms shipments to Israel and divert them to Ukraine. Ukraine needs them more. Ukraine's fighting for the freedom. Israel's a colonial occupier state. Blah 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 blah. But there there is a shift in that direction. And I look. I I'll be honest. I thought that Ukraine would certainly be the country to get abandoned. But we are seeing a seismic shift where. Israel, the Zionist lobby, by no means has lost its influence. But in terms of the American Empire, in terms of broader strategy, 
they realize that much like in the Cold War, Israel sometimes has to take a backseat. Israel sometimes has to take second priority. By no means would they let Israel fall. By no means would they let the Iranians or whoever uh, directly attack Israel and that they'll stand with them in those operations. But when it comes to the broader global game of the American Empire, Israel's going to have to sit down and shut up for a little bit because we have business to deal with in Ukraine or in Taiwan or in Korea or wherever else that might require the American Empire's attention. Sure, we have the operations in the Red Sea that have been unsuccessful thus far, but th- those also do have to deal with global shipping lanes. This isn't purely on behalf of Israel, and although the Houthis have more or less outright stated at this point uh, that Russian, Chinese, and Iranian ships are guaranteed safe passage. Now, they haven't been attacking them, but they've actually explicitly guaranteed them safe passage at this point. And Israel is realizing that in a world of... I hate to use the term because it's overused, uh, multipolarity, or at least the collapse of American hegemony, the receding of American hegemony. American hegemony is Norwooding, as some may say. But in, in that world, they do not have the power or influence they, they had. And when it comes to a lot of the politically active elements of, uh, let's say, a Jewish persuasion in the United States, many of them are coming to the conclusion that shoring up the American empire is better for their interests than Israel. A lot of them have a somewhat of a dislike for Israel ever since the 90s because after the labor Zionists, after those people fell out of power, Israel became much more of a conservative and religious state. They looked down upon them as they looked down upon their Hasidic cousins, so to speak. And not that every Israel is Hasidic, but you, you get the point. They, they looked down upon them as sort of their uh, racist backwards cousins, as I'm sure we've all heard the rhetoric coming out of liberals before. And they realized, yes, sure, it's nice to have the state, it's nice to have the Jewish state, whatever, uh, but number one, we can't condone what they're doing because of our uh, liberal moral quandaries. Not that I'm saying that liberal moral quandaries are the only reason the post is going on in Israel, but let's be honest, that's the case for a lot of these people. And number two, it comes at the expense of American political hegemony, a country where we may never admit it, we are very privileged and very influential in, and we don't want to give that up. And yes, it's far more of a priority to see <laughs> to see Ukraine triumph than have the Gaza Strip cleared out. And I, I would say, it's particularly for uh, the American di- uh, Jewish diaspora, that that would be the higher priority at this point. And Israel is, is falling out of favor with them, especially among the, the younger generation. And especially as the demographics diverge, as Israel becomes more of a right-wing conservative because of the people who actually reproduce there, versus uh, the American Jewish diaspora, the, uh, what's happened to them. And frankly, their broader assimilation into the American monoculture, it's... You can see where the two start to spread apart. And what other sponsors does Israel have at this point? Because they're... They're feeling the heat of... a world that doesn't bend to their will come down upon them. They enjoyed it for the past 20 years. Post-9-11, Israel is the poster boy. They're our greatest ally in the war against terrorism. They were treated well before that, but especially after 9-11. Support and priority for Israel through the roof, to say the least. And they're now coming to a world where that is not necessarily the case. They've lost the favor of the younger generation, um, of both the diaspora and just the American electorate in general, which is their most important sponsor, their most important guarantor. The people who, through their either their direct or indirect actions, who are flooding into Europe, have no sympathy for them. The European youth have no sympathy for them. And, like I said, aside from maybe a few Zionist lobbies speckled throughout the world outside of the United States, support for Israel is simply just not a priority for a lot of these people. Sure, they might get passing support from right-wing movements across the world, but insofar as the rabid undying loyalty, you're not going to get that from anyone aside from American boomers and the Republican establishment. And even those are showing signs of age, both figuratively and literally. So, how much longer that can go on? And the the idea that, yes, we might meddle in Israel... I mean, I know Obama tried to displace Netanyahu and actually support his opposition in uh, I believe the 2012 Israeli election... But point being, so this isn't anything new. Uh, 
But the idea that Israel might be treated like, say, we treat our European partners, maybe not quite as harshly, but how we treat our other partners, uh, it might become a reality, and they might have to get used to being the junior partner. Like, like I said, I can't see a circumstance under which America abandons Israel by any means. There's far too much influence there. And given the American game for global domination, they are a valuable chess piece in that regard. But Israel is going to feel far more of the vassal ship that other American allies feel. I don't know, unless they go in the direction of Turkey, I, maybe they'll pull off some, maybe somehow, some way, they'll pull off some sort of playing both sides maneuver. I don't think they're capable of it. I, I think the only reason Turkey is is because of the geography. But I don't know, maybe maybe they will pull that off. And, uh, or, or maybe the Ukrainian war will be a resounding success and they'll get second Israel to get to rebuild Khazaria. Who knows? Who knows? But I'm, I, I'm getting off into to fringe territory at that point because at, I, all of it is a, a little absurd. I, I do have to admit, but as far as the prospects for Israel, they're living in a world that's no longer theirs, and frankly, I couldn't care less about that. What they're doing, their actions in Gaza, I'm, I'm certainly not going to condone. I, I never have. Uh, but ultimately, there's only so much I can say or do about that. But them having to feel the heat of any other country, I know it's been said by many times by many people that Israel is becoming a normal country and, and they're feeling the heat of that, and you know what? Good. If the rest of us have to be dragged through this mud, join in. And that's, that's really all I have to say. Um, so... I know I kept this a bit short, and I want to keep the analysis a bit brief, because there's only so much I can say alone without the, the dialogue, and I, I hope you guys did enjoy this, and let me know uh, if you want some more solo episodes, or if you prefer I just wait for GSP to return, if you feel like the dynamic's better to have both, I mean, it is better, but if you feel like you would just rather wait for the return rather than listen to me ramble on for an hour and a half, um... I won't be offended, just certainly let me know your preference if you want me to keep this, or if you want me to just put up brief reports in the absence, just to keep you guys informed, but uh, point being is, I, I will be in touch with you guys, whether it's through um, more solo episodes, uh, of course, once GSP returns, whether it's through posts, or whether it's through just shorter episodes, and just uh, video segments on some topics that we might discuss on the show that uh, otherwise I wouldn't, because we would include in the show, so just let me know uh, your preference on all of that, and I'll see you guys next time, and goodbye.